Of all the names to achieve a place in the history of crime and punishment, perhaps none has ever got there in quite the same way as the name Wes Moore. Wes Moore himself explains it all in a new book with the perplexing title, The Other Wes Moore. Now Russ Mitchell sorts it all out. This is Wes Moore. Johns Hopkins graduate, military officer, Rhodes Scholar, charmed life, very blessed life. Chesapeake Correctional Institution. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. You may start the conversation now. Wes, you hear us? Yeah, I hear you good now. This you is the other Wes Moore. I thought that I had to uh, be on the streets and, and be in the, uh, the life of a crime. I thought that was my only real talent. It's hard to imagine a more unlikely pairing. One, a celebrated student, college football Hall of Famer, White House fellow. The other, in a maximum security prison, serving a life sentence for murder. There was this, this terrible robbery of a, a jewelry store, and an off-duty policeman was killed. And just Joy Moore called her son, who was studying in South Africa. He said, the cops are looking for a man in your neighborhood with your name. And I was like, what? And she said, there are wanted posters in your neighborhood saying, wanted Wes Moore, assumed to be armed and very dangerous. Part of me, when I first heard it, was, wow, my glad Wes is so many thousand miles away that they weren't looking for my son. All the same, this Wes Moore couldn't get the other Wes Moore out of his mind. He began visiting him in prison and found a man who was troubling and complicated, but also more reflective than he'd expected. I learned just how much we, we had in common and more than just our name. Both men grew up in nearly identical drug-ridden areas where both were making names for themselves on the streets and as behavior and academic problems at school. Also, both men were raised by single moms. On the face of it, they were living parallel lives, but in reality, they were heading in very different directions. Here are their not-so-simple stories. This neighborhood was we'll begin with this West Moore. Before he was even four, his world unraveled. His father, Big Wes, as his family called him, a 34-year-old television journalist in Maryland, died suddenly as his young son watched. I started hearing him come down the stairs, and I ran to the stairs, and then he collapsed, and he just fell. And I remember my mother running in from the, from the kitchen and pot falling and, and just chaos all around me. And I just remember just staring. In the years following her husband's death, Wes's mother, Joy, struggled emotionally and financially. She's a widow now. She's a single mother. She's got three kids. And she could see their neighborhood outside Baltimore was turning dangerous. So she moved her family to live with her parents in New York. But Wes says their Bronx neighborhood would prove to be worse than the one they'd left. So this was definitely a neighborhood in transition when we actually moved back here. For a kid, it sounds like a lot of opportunities to get in trouble. Yeah, a lot of opportunities to get in trouble. when you're. There were some times I really did feel like I was losing my son. Back in Baltimore, the other Wes Moore barely knew his father. This is when they were little. His mother, Mary, had goals for her children. Finish school and go to college and get a good job. It was a hope that Mary herself had grasped but couldn't hold. She was the first person in her family to go to junior college and was accepted to nearby Johns Hopkins University. But when her funding fell through, she had to work full time instead, often leaving Wes with his older brother. He was very close to his brother, Tony. Yes, he was. Over the years, Mary says she knew Tony was becoming a well-known drug dealer. But she thought he was taking a do as I say, not as I do approach with Wes. Tony was streetwise and all that, and he knew what was out there, and he didn't want that same thing for his brother. But by the time Wes was 13, he was already following in his big brother's footsteps. Soon, he says, he started making thousands of dollars a day and never looked back. You know, I, I thought uh, everything was supposed to come to me at, at, at light speed. But when I was given opportunities to, to take my time and be patient, I, I rushed past them. Around the same time, up in the Bronx, 11-year-old Wes Moore, like the other Wes, was looking to the streets.
for a sense of belonging. It all starts off with little stuff, walking into a corner store and stealing a candy bar. It's just amazing how fast uh, that graduates to much more serious stuff. You had a nickname in the neighborhood? I did, Kid Cupid. Kid Cupid. Kid Cupid. Was that bestowed on you, or did you give that one to I yourself? gave it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it to myself, and my tag was just two Ks next to each other with a circle uh, around it. There are quite a few Bronx walls that had, uh, had those two Ks next to it. This is the place you spray painted? This is it right here. And got caught? Got caught. So my friend and I were actually tagging, and basically a cop car turns the corner, and you hear that distinctive, like, whoop, whoop, you know, the, the cop sirens. Right. They grab me, put the cuffs on me, and next thing I know, I was, I was in the back of a police car, and I'm just terrified. I couldn't even imagine the phone call to my mom telling him, you need to come pick up your son. That call never came. The cop took us out and undid the handcuffs, and he said, get moving. Did you learn a, a lot from that? Uh, I, I think I did for a short period of time. It's amazing how fleeting that is. And all I was looking for was acceptance. And if that meant spray painting some walls, skipping some classes, you know, getting into fights, then that's what I was going to do. He was heading down the wrong path. I said, no, not again. I lost my husband. I'm not going to lose my son. His grandparents took a loan against their house to give their daughter Joy the money she needed to send her only son here. Valley Forge Military Academy. Sending him to military school was probably one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. Um, I agonized. She'd been threatening me with military school since I was like eight years old. So I was like, there's no way she's going to send me away. Do you remember, remember exactly what he said to you at that time? Uh, <laughs> no, he had more sense than to say exactly what he was thinking. <laughs> In those first four days, I literally ran away five times from the military. Five times in the first four days. That's right. That's right. And exactly. after that fifth time, even the school had had enough. They brought him to a phone, and he dialed the only number he knew. The 12-year-old started pleading as soon as his mother answered. She stopped me, and she's like, too many people have worked for you to be here, uh, so you need to give it a shot. So it was really tough for me to hear that level of, of, of pain and sincerity in her voice, but I think it was also part of the trigger that really helped it all make sense to me. What was it about that phone call? Her persistence. And, uh, you know, my mother wasn't going to give up on me, even though I was giving her a lot of reasons to do so. And the idea that this was bigger than me, that yearning, that acceptance I was looking for, I had the whole time, and it was with my family. Some of the proclamations. It was a push that led to many small successes. After that first year, I was actually doing well academically, and I was doing well tactically, and I was actually allowed to participate uh, on, on sports teams because up until that point, I was always on probation. I was trying to say, you know, this isn't too bad, this doing well thing. He graduated with honors at 17 and returned to the city of his childhood, Baltimore. This time, he was an undergraduate at Johns Hopkins University. All the barriers, all the, the glass ceilings, and in many ways, almost uh, you know, self-imposed glass ceilings that I had over me were lifted. The other Westmore's life could not have taken a more tragic and violent turn. On February 7, 2000, 24-year-old Wes, along with his brother Tony and two others, came to this jewelry store armed with guns. Ryland Powers was working there. Suddenly, two guys come around this side, two come around this side. Everybody hit the floor, getting you know. Standing over him, a man he identified to police as Wes Moore. Some things you never forget. But Wes Moore, you saw he had a gun. He was right here. What, what role did he have? He, he was more or less like, you know, the, the ringleader, you know? Powers says the four men were already fleeing when one of them shot Police Sergeant Bruce Prothero in the head and chest at point-blank range. 29-year-old Tony Moore later confessed to the shooting. His younger brother, Wes, has always insisted he wasn't even at the heist. When he says to this day, you know, he wasn't here, he wasn't, didn't have a gun, he wasn't part of this, you say why? He's a lying piece of garbage. The brothers went into hiding, sparking a national manhunt. They were arrested in the 2200 block of North 19th Street. They were, they were captured in Philadelphia. Tony pled guilty to avoid the death penalty. He died in prison of kidney failure two years ago. Wes was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Do you feel bad at all for the officer who died the night of the jewelry store robbery? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. And also, I see how the pain that, that the family...
family must feel for the pain that my family feels. And I'm still living. I'm still here breathing and being able to, to talk to them and speak to them, you know, and hug them and kiss them. And, and that family don't have the opportunity to do that. The year of the murder, the Moore brothers' high-profile case often made headlines. But one day, this Wes Moore made a headline of his own. It was one of the most remarkable moments because I thought to myself, you know, here I was, a kid who literally less than a decade ago was sitting in the back of a police car with handcuffs on and being sent away to a military school for academic and disciplinary reasons. And now I'm standing here hearing a gentleman announce me as a Rhodes Scholar. Today, the other Wes Moore, now 34 years old, is focusing on his four children. Daddy trying to be a better example to y'all. I don't want people to think of us as being bad people. Uh, I, I think sometimes my children might be embarrassed, but I'm being proud and I'm trying to change that. Yeah, you know what's he's talking about. His mother, Mary, is raising two of Wes's children. What would you say you're doing differently? Well, um, bring them up in a better environment, getting, you know, better schooling, better education, um, spending more time with them, um, participating in activities, all the things I didn't do. Like, God gave me a second chance to do it right. So I'm doing it right. She hopes her son's children will have lives more like this Wes Moore, who still ponders their common name but very different fates. I think a tremendous amount of life is luck. Who gave birth to you? Who are your family? Who are your friends? Which neighborhoods did you grow up in? My mother says kids need to think that you care before they care what you think. They want leadership. If I wasn't lucky enough to have people help provide that to me, the kids in the corner sure would have.